Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I am here as usual with my partner in crime, Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? Well, I'm doing well, Cass. How are you? I'm doing good. I feel bad that I didn't ask you how you were doing last time, but I, I you know, <laughs> trying to get past it. You know, I'm, I assume you forgive me. I, I'm, I guess I'll apologize publicly. I'm sorry. You were excited to talk to Liz. I was excited to talk to Liz. It worked out okay. <laughs> That's right. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a, a couple different issues and not necessarily that related, but slightly related. Um, and that is Bitcoin mining and Kazakhstan. To start, I would I would prefer that we kind of delve into how Bitcoin mining works, what Bitcoin mining is. I'm sure when we did our Bitcoin episode, we kind of went over it, but do you want to do a like a more complete definition of of Bitcoin mining and how it works? Sure. I'll try. Bitcoin miners burn money in the form of energy, which is fed into specially designed machines with computer chips optimized for a specific algorithm that's used in Bitcoin mining. These chips perform a variety of computations, trying to get a certain leading value to their number that then allows them to create and submit the next Bitcoin block. Miners, because they're submitting the blocks, get to take the transaction fees paid in that block and what's called the Coinbase transaction for that block, which is the first transaction in the block and the one that issues the new Bitcoins. So miners spend money, get energy, use the energy to run a bunch of computer chips, and then if they're lucky, the pool pays them enough Bitcoin to make up for the money they burned in the form of energy. Yeah, and to put it in a very simple way, I think Bitcoin mining is basically a lottery that there's odds based on how many miners you run and how much electricity you use that you are you are going to get the next Bitcoin. You're going to win the next Bitcoin. And so so it it's similar to a lottery, but it's closer in a sense maybe to like a a racetrack. You can bet on a certain horse because you know that the odds for that horse are better than other ones, right? Like Bitmain, we, we, we were gonna bring this up a little later, but I think it's worth mentioning. Bitmain was or is the number one Bitcoin miner in the world. They also produce miners, uh, what are called Bitcoin miners. So they produce the Bitcoin miners for other mining companies and individuals. But essentially, they're the leader of the horses or were the leader of all of the horses there for a while. So the odds are if you were going to place a bet on who would win the next Bitcoin, it would generally be Bitmain. And I, I don't know how much that has changed, but maybe you should talk a little bit more about Bitmain and their role in, the, in what Bitcoin mining is and was. Sure. I think the analogy that you made to like the uh, slots or whatever is appropriate with the caveat being that mining is often a positive expected value activity. You're mining because you expect to make money from it, whereas with gambling, you're generally expected to lose money. And it's often easier to model out the EV than it is in certain uh, gambling things. Bitmain is an interesting case because back in like the block size war, they were, I think, the largest single miner on the Bitcoin network and they administered Ant Pool, which was one of the larger pools controlling a lot of hash rate. Uh, during the blow up of Bitmain, after the block size war, my understanding, and I was looking into this before we recorded today because I was curious about this. Most of Bitmain's mining business was spun out. And so Bitmain itself is no longer like this very large miner on the network. And that business was separated from creating the ASICs, the miners, as you described them. And so their roles are a little bit different now. But uh, for those of us who were around back during the block size war, they were a very opinionated miner who was in such an influential place, both because they controlled the hash rate, but also because they control the flow of new miners, right? They're the single largest producer of Bitcoin miners. And so they've got this bit of influence in deciding how many and where those miners go. Right. And this this is, or sorry, this was a China, I don't know if it still is. I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. And I think the answer to that question might be, what's a China-based Bitcoin business at this point? Like if you still have some executives there, but you've changed your shell corporation to a different jurisdiction or... 
Well, just to clarify, when you look up Bitmain, it says that it is headquartered in Beijing, China. So, but that that is that gets to the next part. Um, so, while I think it's good for us to get at, get what Bitcoin mining is again out of the way. The reason we're talking about Bitcoin mining today is because there was this big moment, and and this there's uh, and there's a certain truth to this. There's kind of on a yearly or semi-yearly basis, there is this China bans Bitcoin headline, and it, it's probably happened ten or fifteen times uh, in the life of Bitcoin. But the reality was that yes, the government actually decided not that Bitcoin transactions were illegal like you can transact in bitcoin and you can buy and sell bitcoin to a certain degree in china but they decided that mining bitcoin was no longer legal and so there's a group at cambridge university that has kept an eye on where bitcoin mining comes from where most of the hash rate is happening and for years almost i would suspect maybe the entire life of Bitcoin, the majority of that hash rate was originating from China. Maybe that happened in 2014 or 15 when they took over 50% of hash rate, something like that. But it's been that way for an extended period of time. China has been where the majority of the hash rate for Bitcoin and a lot of other coins as well takes place. And the reason for this is what Bennett was talking about, right? They're burning money in the form of energy. So where is energy cheapest is usually where Bitcoin miners are going to go. And it just kind of works out that China has a ton of cheap energy. And, and you actually visited one of these, a hydroelectric dam with a bunch of cheap energy in China and saw a Bitcoin mining operation when you visited, right? Yeah, it's, I, it's unfortunate that so many of them are probably actually closed now. I do believe that a lot of them did close down when the government decided it wasn't allowed anymore. But yeah, I got to go to a micro dam in western China. And what I realized, and you can um, check out my Medium page. I wrote a three-part series on this. But what I came to realize was that the owner of the hydroelectric dam was a triad or the Chinese mafia. He was in the Chinese mafia. This isn't some scary guy. He wasn't like freaking me out with the things he was saying or trying to scare me in any way. Totally normal guy with a small plot of land that had a tiny stream running through it. And he had been subsidized by the Chinese government to build this micro dam with the idea being that he would supply the surrounding community with the power that he was getting from his small dam. What he did instead, not instead, because I think he still was supplying the outlying region with some of the energy that he was producing, but what he also did was that he had a warehouse full of ASICs that he was he was renting out this warehouse to these dudes from, I think, Inner Mongolia, very far northeastern China. And these guys were coming down from there to western China, and they were setting up this giant warehouse of ASICs, these Bitcoin miners and Litecoin miners. And they were mining there. He was selling them his electricity at essentially a discount, right? But because all of that was profit for him. It was pure profit. I don't know if he was bribing government officials or if he was just saying, oh, one of my generators is off the grid right now. It's down for repair. And then using that electricity to, to supply the miners. But it was a win-win for both people there. I can understand how... He gets extra cash and the miners get cheap, even cheaper electricity than they normally would. And especially in a place where you don't necessarily want to let government officials know that you're doing that mining. But yeah, so we had this this actual ban. And uh, can you kind of describe what happened when this ban, ban happened last year? What what the kind of result was? Well, at least as far as mining, we saw a pretty substantial drop in hash rate for Bitcoin. It wasn't instantaneous or anything like that, but over a brief period, we saw a bunch of hash rate that previously used to report itself as being from China appear to move to several different places around the world. A major portion of that seemed to have moved to the US, especially Texas. And the reason we're having this conversation today is a bunch of it seemed to move right over the border from China into Kazakhstan. And so this this Brings us to our other massive point. Maybe you've heard about Kazakhstan recently because it's it's been in the news for, well, not the best reasons. A lot of uprisings, a lot of protests, a lot of people 
unhappy with the government, but also unhappy with like rises in the price of petroleum and natural gas there, especially in wintertime when people need it the most in a very cold, cold country like Kazakhstan. But I think it's worth talking to all of you a little bit about the history of Kazakhstan, what's going on there, why Bitcoin miners fl fled there, because I think there's kind of a lot of reasons that many of them would go next door to Kazakhstan from China. But first, let's let's go through a bit of Kazakhstan's history. Kazakhstan, well, it's called Kazakhstan because it's home to the Kazakh people, and it was kind of its own country region until the Russian Empire took it over. And the Russian Empire collapsed and became the largest communist country in the world. And at that point, they decided to take over or make sure that they kept all of these regions that they that that the Russian Empire had under its control. And so they created the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic which along with I don't know how many a dozen other republics more made up what was at the time known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and Kazakhstan was it's a landlocked country next to the Caspian Sea there's not a lot going on there to be quite honest uh, it was agrarian um, it was used to put political prisoners there similar to like Siberia but eventually in 1989 the Berlin Wall fell and in 1990 the Soviet Union began to collapse and that gave us what's now known as Russia but also gave us all these other countries around Russia and the ones like Kazakhstan so I'm they're na the neighbors of Kazakhstan Tajikistan Turkmenistan Uzbekistan Kyrgyzstan all of these countries including Kazakhstan Basically, what happened is the pe the person who was leading it when the Soviet Union collapsed became dictator for life. That was just there was no discussion about a, real elections. There was no real opposition in any of these countries. Almost all of these places got taken over by incredibly dictatorial, autocratic, kind of horrible people. And that really remains true to this day for a lot of them. There's there's some progress in some places, but most of these countries are still ruled autocratically, are still ruled with an iron fist, and you are seeing that now with what's happening in Kazakhstan. Previously in places like Uzbekistan, you know, you've had things called like the Tulip Revolution and you had these other revolutions in the the mid 2000s and a lot of these people were thrown out of office. Kazakhstan was not one of those places. They have a guy who's still around called Nursultan Nazarbayev. He's a running joke in the international community in general. He's this, at this point, multi-billionaire autocratic leader who there's just a lot of, the dude is kind of pathetic, but he got kicked out of office in 2019 and a crony of his has been put in charge since then. So there's really been very little change and the people are fed up, but other republics near Kazakhstan and including the Russian Republic have decided to send troops into Kazakhstan to kind of quell these riots, quell this unrest and these protests. And as far as I can tell, that has happened. But the reason the crypto community even cares at all is because of what Bennett brought up, which is that all of these supposedly a bunch of these Bitcoin miners, not all of them, but a lot of these Bitcoin miners from China fled to Kazakhstan. Now, Bennett, can you maybe suggest some of the reasons for that? I mean, obviously, number one, let's talk about energy. Yeah. So I was looking into some of the uh, International Trade Administration's analyses of Kazakhstan's energy generation, and it is a predominantly fossil fuel based country with most of the power generation coming from coal, but along the uh, eastern and southern portions of the state, there are large hydropower facilities, which may be putting off some of the cheap energy that is in demand by the Bitcoin miners. The other reason that it makes sense that people would have moved into Kazakhstan from China is just geographically, they're neighbors. So if you're trying to physically move thousands of these computers, it might make sense to keep them pretty close. But yeah, um, mining-wise, there's some hydropower there that might have been in use. Otherwise, they were likely probably relying on the coal power that makes up most of the rest of the country's generation. And to be clear, energy is cheap, or up until basically the last month, energy was cheap there. 
And so regardless of whether it was coal created energy or hydroelectric energy, the miners went there because the energy was cheap. Yeah, because that's that's the number one thing miners care about is cost of the energy, because the lower the cost of energy, the more miners you can afford to run, the more likely you are to have a profitable mining business. That's just the way the math works out for this. And this is true for all miners. Miners around the world are driven to whatever location on the earth has the lowest energy cost. That's why we saw so much concentration in China. It's just because the energy costs were so cheap there. If you could get in the right location. So yeah, we see these miners move into Kazakhstan. Cambridge suggests that about 18% of the hash rate ends up located in Kazakhstan. And then the uh, leading ISP, the leading telecom in Kazakhstan, cuts off the internet during these riots, during these protests, and we see about 12% of the Bitcoin hash rate immediately disappear, suggesting that at least 12% of the Bitcoin hash rate was trying to propagate blocks or connect through that network. And so the reason we're talking about this today is because we saw this political unrest in this country end up causing this meaningful change in the hash rate of Bitcoin. And so besides the fact that energy is cheap there, I think there's other incentives for miners to have gone to Kazakhstan. So the the idea that 12% or so are there now doesn't shock me. Besides low energy, you're talking about a country that's relatively close to China. So moving thousands or millions of ASICs is going to be significantly cheaper than moving to just about anywhere else. I assume that the autocratic government was also reasonably welcoming to what could be a nice source of some tax revenue if they report <laughs> if they report their their revenue to the government which i assume in a place like kazakhstan if you don't do it you're in big <laughs> trouble so i think that there there's a few good reasons for this to have happened now this brings up another important point that i wanted to talk about which is that cambridge which does this regular kind of analysis of global hash rate, suggests that by August of 2021, 0% of Bitcoin hash rate was coming from China. Now, that's from in 2019 when seven over 75% or, two, or three quarters of all Bitcoin hash rate was coming from China. I find this incredibly hard to believe. I do not think this is true. It, I trust that a ton of Bitcoin hash rate went away from China when the government made that decision. I have no doubt about that. Most people in China are going to listen to what the government says because you do not want to get in, tr in trouble there. But there's also risk takers in China. And there's going to be some people like the place that I went to, which is a micro dam, which is a tiny place where the government isn't inspecting it constantly and doesn't have the time or the resources to go and see and make sure everything is on the up and up constantly. There's going to be places like that in a country as big as China with as many people as China. I, I will suggest there's 0% chance that 0% of hash rate comes from China. That's my guess. 0% chance that is accurate. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that it's not 0%. And like, Cambridge, in their discussion, their methodology points out some of the reasons that might be. They're partnered with a couple of mining pools, and those mining pools basically share with Cambridge what IPs they see their miners broadcasting from, and Cambridge uses that to infer the locations of the miners. Uh, the mining pools they're partnered with are at least formerly Chinese domiciled businesses, and so those businesses now have a very strong incentive to report to Cambridge that they're not seeing any Chinese IPs. And miners in China now have an incentive to perhaps make the trade-off, take the extra bit of latency, and send their transmission through a VPN or a proxy that would obscure their IP and their location. Supporting this, you sent me a conversation you saw on Twitter between uh, Kevin Zhang at Sino Crypto and Mario Gibney, uh, Mario Gibney and Alejandro de la Torre, who were talking about how they believe that up to about 15% of the current hash rate is still in China and that those miners are just using a variety of techniques to try to obscure that fact. Yep, and this is where I get, I get a little bit, look, Cambridge Obviously, it's Cambridge. It's a great school. I'm not taking away from that. And they do disclose their methodology, which is great. But I think when you start seeing this graph, which is very easy to look at and be like, oh, well, look at that. There's all the numbers right in front of me. A lot of people are not trying to delve just that tiny little bit deeper, 
which is like 0% from China. I'm sorry, what? Let me recheck this methodology and think about how this could be gamed in such a way that these people are definitely lying to Cambridge University and Cambridge is accepting that lie at face value and presenting it at face value because they're disclosing that this is a lie basically in their methodology. That's unfortunate. I don't think that's the right way to go about this. And I think there should be some sort of warning saying like, it's clear to us that there is mining still occurring in China. We just can't properly gauge it because the pools that we talk to aren't going to openly share that information with us. There, there's a better way to disclose this information. And I think that they're in some way incentivized to just show it the way they do. Yeah, it probably would have been better for them if uh, when they saw China drop to literally 0% of the reported hash rate, they put an asterisk next to it that like directed people towards the methodology so they were more aware of the flaws. But you're right, they do publicize it, they discuss it, and they even describe how their methodology could be fooled, which is how part of the way, reason we're able to discuss this the way we are right now. The interesting ramification of that is that if Alejandro de la Torre and Kevin and them are right and 15% or so of the hash rate is still in China, then it's it's an interesting question of how much of the places where we've seen an increase in hash rate are because of new miners coming on in that location, and how much of it is miners in China trying to obscure their location. And so it this is just a reminder that getting accurate data in crypto is extraordinarily hard and uh, doesn't seem to be getting much easier. Exactly. And I want to point out that the country that saw the largest leap in hash rate and the biggest jump up was supposedly the United States of America. So my guess would be that a lot of these Chinese miners, up to 15% of them, would be using a proxy or a VPN that would suggest they're in the United States of America. Well, and we do know several companies who were mining in China who did relocate to Texas and other parts of the United States. So like we've seen photos of the ships at the boxes full of ASICs and stuff that were physically moved. But yeah, some portion of the hash is still in China and is pretending not to be. There's a category that's labeled um, other. Other took a giant leap up uh, since China did this ban on Bitcoin mining and other um, could just as easily be obfuscated in, in such a way. So I think there's a lot of, like you said, there's no way to accurately, unless you have data from every electrical grid in the world and you knew how to analyze that to find leaps at the right time in energy usage, there's no way for you to ac accurately report where this mining is, is taking place, which is a in a sense, a positive thing for Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies. I mean, that proves that in some way it is anonymous. It is difficult to track this stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. I think even if you had the power grid data and you started trying to investigate new hotspots, you'd probably encounter a bunch of grow rooms along with the uh, miners you're finding and stuff like that. Like there's other things that are potentially high margin and use a lot of energy. So yeah, you can argue that this is in a sense one extra bit of obscurity that helps protect Bitcoin miners from physical violence or things that could affect the network. I just wish there was a more accurate way to find out this information, but at the same time, I accept that we can't. But I think Kazakhstan is something people should keep an eye on. This is like a very volatile moment in Kazakhstan history, and it does play a role right now, at least 12% of the role in Bitcoin mining. And Bitcoin is a, a crypto is like a multi-trillion dollar industry, and when Stuff like this happens, and I think it's also really, hopefully it's giving some of these miners pause, because what they did was they just moved to an autocratic country where the leader can turn off the internet and turn off the electricity whenever they want to. We have power outages here in the US. Everywhere has power outages at some point. Generally, the president of America doesn't go, I'm turning off the internet or I'm turning all the electricity off. So I think it's probably a healthy reminder for these miners that while electricity might be more expensive in certain countries and certain places, there's a trade-off you're making when you go to a place like Kazakhstan and just go, well, the energy is incredibly cheap here. Yeah, and I think you're actually getting at what's going to be one of the most interesting dynamics behind Bitcoin mining over the next several years. And that's basically 
and we're starting to already see some of the evidence of this, is Bitcoin mining will move to wherever the energy is cheapest. It will consume as much possible energy there until that energy is no longer the cheapest. In the process of moving, like in these countries where energy is cheap, the process of making the energy substantially more expensive just by using up more of a capacity of the grid often seems to have deleterious social effects. Right. Once you have to start raising the cost of energy, you'll see unrest and issues like that in countries. And so we have started to see, I think, a decent number of companies start to kind of crack down on Bitcoin mining. We saw it first in China. We've seen it now in Kosovo. Uh, I think Sweden shut down Bitcoin mining in their country recently. And so like this dynamic where the Bitcoin miners are basically going to have to move from country to country, always searching the cheapest energy. And as soon as they consume enough of that energy to meaningfully disrupt that energy market, the reaction we often seem to have now is a backlash against those miners, which is going to make balancing the cost of energy versus political considerations is going to be an interesting game for the next several years for miners. I agree, but I also think this brings up a really good counterpoint that I'd like to hear your take on, which is Jack Dorsey, who has stepped away from Twitter to be on Twitter and talk on Twitter, has spoken about how his belief is that a large increase in energy consumption only advances civilization, society, the world, countries that end up doing that. Like it, it is a beneficial thing to see increases in energy because throughout history, an increase of energy output has meant a growth in human productivity. No, a growth in human productivity drives an increase in energy consumption. I, I think he's got the arrow of causation all f***ed up here. Like, as people go to do more productive things, they naturally need to increase the amount of energy generated so that they can do those things. Generating more energy by itself is not a motor that causes any amount of progress to be made. And increasing without end and designing a system which increases without end and proportional to the value of the thing, the amount of energy it consumes does not by itself change any productivity via its increasing amounts of consumption, right? Like Bitcoin's energy consumption has gone up by a factor of, oh, I don't know, 10,000 over the last decade, right? But the productivity benefits of Bitcoin to society have not gone up by the commensurate factor. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Your counter is fair. And, well, and, and part, part of the issue here, and we're getting close to it, so I'm just going to go into it, is like you'll hear Bitcoiners talk about how X percentage of Bitcoin mining involves renewable energy or X percent of what, but that's kind of missing the point here, right? Because there is a finite amount of energy and there's a finite amount of resources that can be used to capture and generate that energy. And Bitcoin's mining is incentivized so that the amount of money that goes into mining Bitcoin asymptotically approaches the amount of Bitcoin captured by the miners in transaction fees in Coinbase. The more valuable Bitcoin becomes, the more money that's burned to capture those Bitcoins. Since that money is being formed, or it burned in the form of energy, the incentive system of Bitcoin is designed so that it will continue to consume as much energy as possible until the amount of dollars that energy represents is roughly equal to the security budget of Bitcoin. And so no matter what, it's going to have this dislocating, displacing effect on the market. So if Bitcoin is being mined using renewable energy like hydroelectric, it's raising the cost of that hydroelectric meaningfully for anyone else who would access that energy source or it's reducing the amount of that source available and i think that's fair but i also want to point out lastly here for me a lot of people discussed how a lot of the bitcoin mining in china was from renewable sources so there are a lot of micro dams in china there are a lot of a lot a lot of energy is produced from solar and from hydroelectric i mean when i was in china every single multi-story building has solar panels on top of the building and has a water catchment basin on top of the building. They're doing things there that America is not doing, that we are not even trying to do. They are subsidizing all kinds of great stuff when it comes to renewable, sustainable energy. I think it has really hurt the Bitcoin environmental case that all of the miners or a lot of the miners, let's say roughly what? 75% of the miners that were there 
have exited. And that hurts, that really hurts the environmental impact of Bitcoin mining, because when you go, when you look at Kazakhstan, like we were talking about before, you're talking about a country that's almost exclusively reliant on coal, natural gas, and petroleum. It does not use renewable energy like China does. There aren't a million micro dams in Kazakhstan. There aren't, there aren't solar panels on the rooftop of every home. It is not the same. It really is not the same. And I, and I think that's, that is an issue. That, it's unfortunate because people bring up the environmental concerns of Bitcoin often. It's not something I really try to focus on at all. But I think this is bad for the environmental, the environmental argument against Bitcoin. It's, it's good for people who don't like Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, to be clear, I was trying to say, even in the best case, it's pretty f-ing bad. And there's a variety of cases worse than that where it's even f-ing worse. Um, <laughs> but, and I, I'm just, this is somewhat unrelated, but I, I'm really excited to see what happens to the Bitcoin hash rate if Texas's grid freezes again this winter. It is fascinating that the places they're running to are places that are unreliable, like Texas, which is one of the reasons why the power is so cheap there. No, it's because it's decentralized. No, no, it's not just because it's decentralized and deregulated, guys. I'm sorry, it's cheap because it kind of sucks, and we've seen it every year. And places like Kazakhstan, where, you know, you're really, you are talking about a dictatorship, and or Russia, for that matter. I mean, China, too. <laughs> to be fair, we're talking about a place with not very much freedom. But but they were allowing Bitcoin mining, you know, and they were, they were letting this kind of go on un- underneath the surface of it all. Um, and the fact that they're not allowing it anymore, the fact that they were worried about where this power was going to, yeah, man, it's going to be a really interesting next five and ten years or so to see how these Bitcoin miners... Litecoin miners, Dogecoin miners um, decide to deal with all of this. Yeah, it's an interesting part of cryptocurrencies, and often the discussion around it gets so abstracted away. Yeah, I think because mostly we we talk about price. I mean, you and I particularly, mostly we talk about frauds within cryptocurrency and bad actors within the space. So mining, which is just kind of like a a thing that happens and can involve good and bad actors. I'm just suggesting that it, it is a really interesting dichotomy that these libertarians and self-sovereign individuals are going to have to deal with when they realize like, oh man, this trillion dollar asset needs to have the cooperation of nation states. Yeah, yeah, or, or at least sufficient economic power to afford to buy them off to get access to the electricity, you know, to pay enough in taxes and stuff that you can't just be over so that's going to do it guys and uh join us next week when we talk to blop uh, i have no idea (laughs) (laughs) join us next week as we talk (laughs) 